Welcome to the Trisco Podcast. We are three druids gathered in a virtual grove to share our thoughts and our path with you. Hi, welcome to episode five, take 3001 for <laughs> this episode of the Trisco Podcast. Why don't we start with introductions? Hi, I'm Drum. My pronouns are he and his. <laughs> Uh, I'm Amber. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm Victoria, and my pronouns are she and her. And in this episode, as you can tell, we're already a little silly. We have been attempting to do this podcast for about the length of time that it normally takes us to do a podcast. (laughs) So uh, apologies for us being slightly loopy today. Today we're going to be talking about working with deity, or in uh, Andreak Fein, we call them the shining ones. So why don't we start out with defining what deity is for each of us? I'm gonna let Amber or Drum start. Drum tag, you're it. Sure. I think that the shining ones or the gods and goddesses are what many pe- bring many people to uh, paganism or neo-paganism, that's where it really brought me there is the idea that there's more than um, one overarching deity um, and that these deities may have different attributes. I see that the gods and goddesses or the shining ones as those entities that can easily bend the laws of the physical world that can, that can make things happen that we as humans cannot do. Um, whether that's multidimensionality or whether that's magic or whether that's an enhanced knowledge of, of you know, our physical world. I think that they can, they can make things happen in our world that we can't do. And I think that's why we turn to them sometimes for healing to say, oh my goodness, this is not working. I need, I need greater help. So I think that these are entities that have powers uh, above and beyond our own. Uh, and the the ability to change the the physical universe around us. I would agree. I would say that, I mean, in general, deities are those bigger powers or bigger energies that exist in the universe that aren't innately human or nature spirit um, in, in their existence. They are a different kind of power. And to me, at least, they feel like a most time a bigger power. Yeah, I mean, I definitely look at spirits and beings on a scale, right, from the the very small, I hate to use small and big because it doesn't quite evoke what I'm talking about. It's sort of the sense of power and presence and influence and um, the gods are at one end of that spectrum. Some of the local land spirits might be at the other end of that spectrum. Um, and so it's those really big, powerful beings that are, that are there that don't necessarily understand the world like we do. But uh, I think I'm safe to say that we are all hard polytheists in that we all believe that the gods are individual beings with their own agency, their own lives, their own will. Um, And they're not like part of a greater whole. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, however, that there are other ways of looking at deity and as far as i'm concerned which one's right Ah, i don't know this is just the way that works for me and um i look at it as a way of default if the gods are all one god or two gods and i worship each of them separately well i don't think the one being would be upset with that but if it was the converse then I think that would be a problem. So I'm just going with the, they can hurt me. I'm going with the safe mode. Um, And it seems to work for me. So sure, let's go with it. And for me, a lot of that comes with personal experience. You know, when, when I work with a being like Athena, to me, the, the energy that I feel that that connection feels very different than connecting with, um, like the Hittite sun god of the sun, Arena. Like it's a, they're very different energies, and to me, it's hard to merge those into a single being. 
it doesn't mean they aren't, but it just, it's not how they feel to me. And so it's a hundred percent just my experiences that have, have led to me feeling that way. I agree with you. I, I really, you know, for me, that separate and distinctness is really important and really characterizes my, my relationship with, with not only the, the shiny ones, but how I think that they exist out there. Um, you know, some of the lore and looking at some of the lore, for example, the Greek lore that I've read when I was younger, um, I take, I take that lore to be factual uh, factual stories uh, of the gods. So I can look to the lore and say, these are descriptions of the gods. Um, and I, to enhance that, these are descriptions of the gods and goddesses at that time. Uh, I think that things, you know, that those distinctions may still exist, uh, but I think that there may be differences today. As we rediscover some of the gods and goddesses that have been forgotten or pushed aside for a long time, I think that they express themselves in ways that may be unique to this time period. And and to, and to cultural differences, my experience with Ubluris, uh, the Hittite god of the western sky, may be markedly different than what the Hittites experienced, uh, but uh, it's still vital and, and real for me. So you talk about looking back at the lore and seeing the lore as stories of the gods. Um, some of our gods don't have the best stories. How do you, how do you work with Zeus? Well, um, that's a good question. I tend, um, you know, with all due respect to Zeus, um, I tend not to work with Zeus very much. Um, there, are, there are stories of Zeus. Uh, I, I think that there are stories of Zeus that I find um, that I have a little bit of trouble with, uh, just with the actions that are undertaken. And granted, they are a divinity and have a, it may have a broader uh, viewpoint than myself. Uh, in my narrow view, some of the actions that may have been undertaken are not what I would have seen as um, um, noteworthy. And so it's, um, you know, I think they, they are what, what they may be. And maybe they have the ability to change over time. Um, they may be timeless. That doesn't mean that they are changeless. For me, that's actually part of why I don't look to the lore as factual stuff. Um, I look at it more as metaphorical experiences. Um, so sometimes the metaphor can can help alleviate some of that discomfort. But sometimes, you know, I, I agree with Drum. There's times where I just, I don't work with beings either because they're associated with things I'm not comfortable with or because I just don't connect to them. What about folks that reinterpret the myths? So uh, I'm going to go into the Celtic lands because that's where I'm much more comfortable, not with the Greeks. Um, but you look at the story of Le and Bolagoeth. If I'm pronouncing those wrong, I apologize to anyone who's Welsh and actually knows how to pronounce them properly. Um, that is the best I can do at the moment. But in the story, Bolagoeth is created to become Clay's wife. She chooses not to. She likes his hunter guy a little bit better, a lot better. Um, sleeps with him, convinces him to kill Clay. Long story. She ends up as an owl, Clay ends up back as a king. Um, in the myth, the way the myth is written down, and admittedly it was written down by Christians, um, but it, it seemed to be Christians who had an interest in actually preserving the lore that was there. So, or it was monks. Um, the way that it is written makes it look like Vladaweth is fickle and um, whatever, all the negative words you can consider throwing at women. But if you look at how it's reinterpreted, um, if you look at the ancient uh, the Genia, 
and I can't remember the, la the end of her name, I will get her full name and link and we will get it in the notes for you, uh, has actually done a number of uh, stories or reimaginings re of that story based upon actual Welsh law at the time. So for example, there is a law that says that a woman can choose to marry a man by letting it be known that she is sleeping with him three times. So publicly letting it, like everybody knows, they're doing the thing three nights in a row. And in the stories, she does that with the hunter. So she is making her choice of who she wishes to marry. And there is, again, if you go back and look at it, it can look like someone who is taking a hold of their power and making their choices and still not sure that killing her former husband was the smartest move, but then there is some potential that she was a, a sovereignty goddess, and so therefore it was the transfer of kingship of the land, um, which is a whole nother episode we can dig into on that. <laughs> but so now you've got the same myth interpreted in multiple different ways, depending on who you're talking to and, who, and how they're looking at it. Um, I know other people that, that look at the myth more as the sovereignty goddess. I know some people that look at the myth, that same myth, uh, in more of a sort of a woman's power perspective. But if you look at the original myth, it doesn't look so good for the woman. You have to put it in the cultural context of when it came from. Right. Um, and I think the same is with a lot of our myths. We have to put it in the cultural context of, of the people who actually wrote it down and what it was like in their time. Well, and the biases that they may have had in that moment. I mean, we, we see the same sort of thing in Greek mythology. You know, if you look at the myth of, of uh, Persephone and her descent, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as written, it's, she's abducted by Hades and stolen away from her family and, you know, tortured essentially in the, in, and tricked into this life in darkness. Um, but there's also uh, people who interpret that as, you know, they, she chose to be with Hades. I mean, he's the almost the only faithful God in all of Greek mythology to his wife. Um, they seem to have a very healthy relationship through the rest of the mythology that they are included in. And how would that come from something like a kidnapping? So there's a reinterpretation from some people that say, no, he didn't steal her. Demeter was bitter because she didn't want Persephone to marry Hades. And so that's, that's Demeter's side of the story. It's not fact. So, I mean, I think that it's one of those things I think to keep in mind in general in paganism is there isn't a thing called dogma. Yeah. We don't actually get to say this is what this is. I kind of like that. It's up yeah. to your interpretation. Yeah, it's, me, it's me raging at all of the anthropological texts that I have read. Let's say, this is the way it was. And I'm like, you don't know. You weren't there. How did you know? Right. No, that's actually a really good point. I mean, I think about, you know, it, there's just the reportage that we have in this day and age. Um, if all of a sudden all of the sources but one disappeared and it was, you know, the onion giving a story of something and it's discovered 10,000 years from now, Wow, would that be way off? Um, so, I mean, not saying that that happened, but we have to, you know, keep an eye on sources and and see that they may not be infallible. Yeah, it really is that that trying to understand who wrote it down and what their biases may have been, right? Like a lot of the Celtic lore that we have, a lot of the Irish, the Welsh lore, was written down by Christian monks. A lot of the Norse lore was, but in the uh, Icelandic, we have these treasure trove of stories that were written down by people who just told them to each other, which, like, that's fantastic. That is as primary source, you know, as you can get. Right. It's not somebody heard a thing, and it's not Snorri heard a thing and wrote it down, and for all he was trying to actually preserve that mythology, there was still other 
reasons for him to tell those stories and write that down, right? He still had kings to please and lords to please and, you know, wanted to keep his job. And back then, one of the ways of losing your job was losing your head. And I'm sure that wasn't something that he wanted to do. Right. So. Well, that's the beauty of like uh, fairy faith in Celtic countries by Evan Wentz is that, you know, he walks through the countryside and talks to people and listens to their stories kind of context-free in a way. I mean, granted, it is the late 1800s when he's doing this, but at least there's stories that aren't, you know, lorded over by a, a you know, religious master. It's just people telling the lore. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, I mean, admittedly, that's one of the advantages that we have to the Greek mythology is that there's just so much of it and it was written by the people in the times, you know? So you may still have issues with translation, where things were translated in a way that is easily misinterpreted. Um, but at least we have the option of getting a lot more primary source material than a lot of Indo-European mythology has. So I am grateful for that. No, yeah. and that is the beauty of the Greeks. I mean, uh, there's so much material there. I, I feel uh, a closeness to some of the Hittite deities and the amount of lore there is sparse uh, at best. Yeah, it's, it's zilch. I mean, we have, we have fragmentary stories, but the descriptions of the gods and my, my experiences of them in, in working, um, in my workings is, you know, for me palpable. And uh, so they could be entirely different than what the Hittites of the time experienced. Um, but for me, they're, you know, they're right there and uh, there's something I can relate to. Well, and yeah. by fragment, sometimes you actually mean like fragments of stone tablets that are like chiseled literally. in, like literal fragments, not right. like partially written. Um, so that's... Well, at least you have words. Recently, I've been working with Kira Nunos. We <laughs> have a bunch of pictures. Right. Yeah. Well, but sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, going to mention a couple of names here, but I'm thinking of Christopher Hughes' new book on Caridwin, which, you know, technically there's not a lot of material on Caridwin, but if you look at this new book coming out from Christopher Hughes, he's done a lot of digging in some unusual places and come up with a remarkable book. Um, so he can read that language though. It is, it's huge and it is helpful. I mean, look, looking at some of the Anatolian myths as you're reading through it, it's like, as you say, it's like the string of words and then it's like this piece of the tablet is missing and then you pick up over here. But it's, you know, sometimes we read between the lines um, and are we rediscovering it? Or are we making it up? I don't know. That's don't a tough know. one. That's a tough one. It's a matter of faith. It is a matter of faith. And I will say that it's, I mean, then we get into the whole UPG concept, right? Right. And what I find fascinating, so for those who don't know, uh, UPG means unverified personal gnosis. And basically it means that I have come up, I as any individual, has come up with some idea about some deity, some spirit, some practice, something. But it's not attested to in the lore, and it's not necessarily something that is sort of commonly agreed upon. It doesn't mean it's wrong doesn't mean it's right, uh, but it is something that works for you or you being the person whoever comes up with the UPG. Um, I remember one time I was working, so uh, I haven't been recently, but I, when I was learning the runes, I was working with Woden. And for me, tobacco was a thing, pipe tobacco, very specifically, uh, was an offering that worked for him. Now, I tended to work with the Wanderer guys, who I envisioned as sort of the, you know, cloaked, hooded, staff, pipe kind of guys. So pipe tobacco made sense to me. Um, and I remember one time I mentioned it on a board, and I got yelled at, because tobacco was not appropriate for uh, anyone from the Icelandic or Scandinavian worlds because it didn't exist there. I have since learned that I'm not the only person that thinks they wouldn't like tobacco. Uh, so it's, it varies uh, on 
whether it works for you or it's works for a bunch of different people or not. Exactly. I mean, some of that gets into the difference between neo-paganism and reconstructionism. You know, yeah. I, I definitely fall more into that neo-pagan co- uh, category, but I try to reconstruct some of the, the stuff that the ancients were doing, but it doesn't mean that I can reconstruct everything or that I want or need to. Um, for some people, that's what they're after, and that's great. But, you know, th- that's where that falls to me is that, sure, you're right. They probably didn't offer tobacco, you know, a thousand years ago. Right. But <laughs> I have it. At, they also didn't use the Internet to record a video. Right. So <laughs> that doesn't mean that this is not a valid part of my practice at this point. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, I, um, it's like I use pipe tobacco for ancestors. My grandfathers both smoked pipes. It works. Um, but then there's, uh, so from UPG, from individual gnosis, as folks talk about it, um, and as I mentioned, you have to be a little careful about where you mention it because Know your audience. Uh, are they receptive to the idea of something new or not? And then you come up on shared gnosis. So you you get where a lot of different people are coming up with the same ideas all independently, like Odin, like Odin likes tobacco, um, and or coffee. It's actually one of the other ones, uh, and so you get folks agreeing and apparently felines agreeing that this is a, this is a thing that is appropriate now, whether it was appropriate, you know, back in the days when the lore was written down. Um, but I think our gods do evolve. So I think that they're, you know, if they are beings with their own agency, why not try new things? I mean, we may also be biased. We might have just made offerings to the gods of the internet to make sure that this video <laughs> happens, which again, don't, I, I've read a lot of mythology. I haven't found that one yet. So. No. Uh, yeah, and it was just generally to the gods of the internet because I'm not sure I could name them at this point. <laughs> I don't care which one you are, just please fix it. Absolutely. <laughs> So we talked earlier about where we all identify as hard polytheists. So what is your view on deities that are very, very similar or worshipped in locations that... So I'm trying to think of how to put this into words and it's not flowing. Minerva and Athena, are they the same being or not? How, how do you view those types of, of correlations and deities? Uh, those... Uh, it depends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I like that. It depends. does depend. Um, so Norse mythology, we have the same challenges with Freya and Frigga. Uh, Frigga is attested uh, in sort of the Anglo-Saxon Germanic lands more. Uh, Freya is not attested there. Freya is attested in Scandinavia. Some people say she's the same because uh, entomologically, is that the right word? Bilinguistics, um, the names are related and very, very closely related. So the question becomes, are they the same being? Um, There's also, there's bits in the lore that, that point to the potential of them being the same being, which I will happily get into later if we dig into Norse mythology more. Um, but for me, they're different beings, right? I work with both. They're both on my altar in the living room. And to me, they're different beings. There's a spinning wheel back here that you all can't see, um, that is dedicated to Frigga, not Freya. Yeah, I think they're different beings as well. And I think they're, they were different beings to the different peoples, um, that worship them. Um, of course, by the, the other side of that story is that, you know, 
how can I say that same thing about me today, looking at, you know, at the same too, because I'm taking, uh, my context is totally different than theirs. You weren't there. Right. So See, I think. And that's, go ahead. No, please. So that, that comment there is actually what brings it to mind for me. I actually wrote a paper about the Sun Goddess Arena because I, I agree. Most of the time, these are all very different beings. Um, but when I started looking at Araniti and trying to figure out who she was, because there's not a lot of resources, you know, it's those fragments of fragments and stuff. Um, but as I researched, I found a haddock tablet that says Morisimu, also known as Araniti. So there's actually ancient tablet that says this god is this god. Yeah, but then you run into the challenge of the Greeks invading everybody and saying that this god is now actually this Greek god. Right. right. Same thing with the Romans. They did that as well in Gaul. Right. Oh, god. But it, yeah. it, suddenly it's very interesting because I see them as different beings, but I also base my practices on the practices of the ancients who are telling me they're the same. And so it, for me, it's become a really interesting thing to try to mm -hmm. settle in my brain and, and, you know, it became a, it depends right. because of that. Because I, I, I've heard the Hittites talked about as the, you know, the land of a million gods because they may have had, you know, this city had Araniti and this city had Araniti and this city had Araniti. And they say, you know, we're told that, oh, they were all different. Uh, and is that true? I mean, linguistically the same name, the same location, but it, it depends, you know, I guess that's all we can say. Well, uh, was, it, was it the Greeks or the Romans? Apologies, my, my Southern European mythology is back in high school. Um, that had like, cause it'd be like Athena city name and Athena different city name. Like they would, mm -hmm. they would double barrel and triple barrel the names. And are those referring to different deities? Or different aspects of the same deity right. so that also depends um, it, <laughs> with Greek mythology sometimes it is an attribute of it but other times you'll see that it's it's two deities that they've merged into one being and so they're using both names as one so they will take a deity and they will merge merge that deity into one and suddenly the name it gets longer didn't they do that with like Hermes and Thoth or something? I don't remember. That's a lot later. Right. Okay. That's more in like Alexandria that they did a lot of that type of stuff. It is interesting. I think um, when it comes to, you know, what I would call essential deities like um, solar deities, the, the moon and the sun, where we see gender differences uh, mm -hmm. based on um, linguistic gender differences you know it, the moon here is feminine the moon here is masculine in different languages that's really 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 interesting to me uh, as mm -hmm. to why that is um, well and, and what part of what made that really bizarre to me so arena is the sun goddess right one of the deities that she's merged with is the earth goddess she's the goddess of the the, the dark earth and the dead huh. and so suddenly and then you, you go another step and it's the, the fire of the, like the hearth goddess for that culture. So suddenly Arena is the goddess of all three realms. Like she's the goddess of the fire in the no. sky and the fire in the earth and the fire on this realm. Yeah, but there's that, there's that myth, sort of myth cycle that is in the Egyptian, but it's also in, I haven't dug into it a whole lot, but it is in the museum in Denmark. Um, that there is this myth cycle that, it is a god that goes through the sun and then goes into the water, goes under the ground, you know, and then comes back around and does that, that cycle. Right. And so it's that sun cycle where the sun does go underground and become part of the underworld. And then mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the myth in Denmark, it become, it, the sun gets eaten, as it were, and becomes like part of the, the beings under the ocean and under the world. Uh, and then it comes back up again. And so I find it interesting that, because it's that like, it's that cycle that we're seeing in multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. right. It's the whole but Cyrus a, too. Absolutely. And, and, but it was that, like that change in role 
that, you know, she went from being a sun goddess to being an earth goddess that, you know, you have to look at myths like that to see how those two would connect, how they would be correlated. They, they aren't beings that I would typically associate as being one. Right. So. It's a big shift and it would be interesting to see why that happened. Right. If we, if we could do the doctor who thing and say, Hey, what happened there? I know. It's really, this is, this is where a TARDIS would be handy. Speaking oh, of Who. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's go back and see what they were thinking. Okay. Oh, and then speak their language. And that would be amazing. Because then oh we could read goodness. all of our books and so, read all of our tablets and listen to all of their stories. So thank you all for listening to us uh, today as we head on out. First, we're going to do a reading for what's coming up for the next few weeks. So, Drum, if you would be so kind. I would be glad to. Okay. Um, our first uh, did a three OM reading, and uh, the very first of the uh, OM is called Alum. And uh, Alum represents um, high sight and long view. The idea is to be able to see past the forest um, and, and kind of look ahead to see what's down the road. Uh, the second OM that we have is Moon, uh, the vine, and that's about prophecy, uh, an interesting thing to do when you're doing a reading. And uh, the last one is called Lush, and Lush is, um, is about protection. So I think what this is saying is that uh, in these next couple weeks, um, you know, we're going to look ahead to our next podcast for sure uh, and try to see, you know, past the, past the forest into the, uh, and past the trees uh, to what's coming. I think that's important when we um, just do our, our, daily, our daily workings and our daily endeavors is to keep in mind uh, that there's always something further ahead than just the immediate present. Um, Moon says to uh, extend yourself like the vine. Uh, the vine reaches out um, through, the, uh, through the use of, of wine to open yourself up, but uh, be like the vine and reach out into the world and see what you can find, uh, not only through divination, but through your own intuition. And finally, uh, Lush says, uh, be protected as you move forward. So uh, protection from enchantment, most assuredly, and just uh, protection in general. So look down the road, uh, open yourself up to what's coming, uh, but be cautious and, be, and protect yourself along the way, especially in these COVID times. Cool. Wear a mask. Stay Wear a mask. Wash mm -hmm. your hands. Depending on where you are, and wash your hands. All right. Thank you all very much. It was great chatting with you, and we'll see you again in a few weeks. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us for today's video. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. You can also find more episodes on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast providers. You can find us on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, or for more information, visit our website, triscolpodcast.weebly.com.